Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rob Moffitt. I'm the lead portfolio manager here for Middlefield Healthcare Strategies. For those of you who I haven't met, I've been with Middlefield for seven years and been involved with the healthcare fund since then. Um, here at Middlefield, we manage two healthcare strategies. We have an ETF and a mutual fund. Essentially, these two products are the same portfolio. They're just in a different wrapper. So it's a portfolio of actively managed healthcare stocks, um, 30 to 40 names typically in the portfolio. Today, we're at the low end of that range with 32 names. And that's just a function of us high grading recently and trying to stick to highest quality names. Um, and as always with our other strategies at Middlefield as well, we have a focus on dividend paying companies. So uh, both of these funds, as you can say, as you can see, pay attractive yields and they emphasize companies that um, pay and grow their dividends over time. Um, today, I have the pleasure of being joined by our exclusive industry advisor, Dr. Richard Evans. Um, Richard is with a firm Sector and Sovereign Research or SSR and Ever since the inception of these funds, Richard's been an extremely valuable resource for us. And uh, Richard and I have frequent conversations. We speak every two weeks on a regular basis. So um, many of our clients have met Richard over the years, but I'll just uh, allow Richard to introduce himself and give a brief overview of, of SSR. Uh, great, thanks. Hey, Rob. Um, so SSR is uh, an advisory services and data uh, boutique. Um, my particular sleeve of SSR is the healthcare sleeve, and we focus on uh, healthcare companies around the globe. Uh, our main emphasis is on biopharma, uh, but we cover uh, all sectors uh, of the global healthcare business. Thanks, Richard. And I, I will just add that, you know, you've been particularly helpful with us navigating drug pricing, the regulatory environment, um, what's going on in hospital utilization, et cetera. So um, those conversations always very beneficial and they uh, really funnel into the asset allocation decisions that we're making in the portfolios. Um, before I ask Richard a few more questions, I just wanted to provide a bit of a, an update on the fund and a, maybe a bit of a market backdrop. So, um, as, as we all know, I think uh, 2023 returns in the market have been quite bifurcated. Defensive sectors, including healthcare, have really lagged this year. And that is a big reversal from last year when defensive sectors were outperforming. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, consumer oriented sectors such as tech, communications, um, consumer discretionary sectors have outperformed. And I think that's largely a function of the economy being more resilient than. Uh, many of us had had uh, expected. And I think it'll be interesting to see how long that condition persists with all the macro risks that we're seeing starting to build again. Those would include geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, um, gridlock in Congress, and of course, rising treasury yields, which are on the top of everyone's mind. Um, but against this backdrop, as you can see by the, uh, the performance table on the right, um, our actively managed dividend focused strategies have performed well in this environment. Uh, the S&P 500 sector is down 4.1% as of the end of September, and our funds are down just 2.2 to 2.7%. 2 to 2 so um, we are um, doing our job and active managed strategy is working. Um, taking a little bit closer look at the funds attribution, um, kind of looking at what has been working this year and what hasn't for us. Um, just like the broader market, performance has been bifurcated within the healthcare sector, as you can see. And on the positive contributor side of the portfolio, pharma has been a big contributor, and that's been predominantly driven by selection effects. So we have picked the right stocks in that sector. We have big weights in Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk, and we also have um, quite a bit of exposure to some other companies that have outperformed, such as AstraZeneca and Merck. Um, the distributors, healthcare distributors, that's been another positive contributor, and that's more of an allocation effect. So we are overweight, the distributors, and predominantly through exposure to a company called McKesson, which is up 20% year to date, and has been a big winner for us. And the last contributor performance relative to the benchmark has been in managed care. And that's actually been a function of us being underweight managed care. And um, mostly in the first half of the year, we were worried about hospital utilization picking back up after a few years of um, folks not visiting hospitals and getting procedures done. Um, that's a headwind for managed care because their expenses go up. And uh, we'll get into it later, but we are, are starting to get a little more comfortable with that 
an environment and warming up to managed care now, but it has been a, uh, beneficial being underweight year to date. Um, on the detractor side of things, we've been underweight healthcare supplies, and that has um, detracted per, from performance within it, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively small sub industry. And within that, it would be more dental focused names and eye care. And the reason we've been underweight has been largely based on our views on the consumer. Um, but as you can see on the chart, healthcare supplies have performed very well. Um, healthcare services, another area that has hurt us a bit. Um, that's predominantly selection effect. We had exposure to CVS, which we've since reduced. We reduced that position in the summer, um, but that uh, impacted performance, especially in the first half of the year. And then finally, life science tools and services. Um, we've been relatively equal weight this area, but um, the impact here has been more of a selection effect. Again, a stock called Illumina was uh, detracting to performance, and that stock is no longer in the portfolio. And we um, happy to report sold that much higher than where it's trading today. Okay. Um, but again, I mean, overall, in summary, um, our active strategy has been additive to performance. And, um, you know, I think it it speaks to the value that active management can add to uh, to investing in the sector. Um, the last two slides really were backward looking. And here we're just highlighting why we think healthcare is a good investment today, now going forward. Um, what you get with healthcare is defensive growth. So the companies in the healthcare sector inherently provide needs-based products and services, and that makes their earnings more insulated from macro conditions. Um, the long-term demographic tailwinds for healthcare are firmly intact. As we know, the population is aging and seniors spend significantly more on healthcare. Um, and another thing, and the reason that we think Canadians should be especially interested in healthcare is that it is very underrepresented in Canadian portfolios. It's the second largest sector in the S&P 500 at about 13%, yet it's less than 50 basis points of the TSX. And finally, what you get with healthcare is a great deal of diversification. So as you saw, even on the previous slide, not all sub industries per behave the same way. And you do get an attractive mix of growth, value, and you can tilt the portfolio in a more defensive or a more cyclical posture, depending on market conditions. Um, specifically, a few areas that we like right now and where we're invested in. Uh, we'll go into more detail with Richard, but um, biopharma, which represents over 50% of the sector's market cap. Uh, we continue to like biopharma right now. Um, this sector, I would the companies in this area, I would characterize as large, established, diversified companies. They have strong and big balance sheets and multi-billion dollar products that are protected by patents. So very um, stable revenue and, and earnings from those companies. And in addition to the products that are already in the market, there's also a ton of innovation taking place in biopharma. These companies spend billions of dollars on R&D in their pipelines every year, and they're always searching for the next big blockbuster drugs. Um, the story in, in biopharma this year, year to date, has really been GLP agonists. Um, that's been all the hype. Uh, I'm sure many of our uh, investors would be familiar with the names Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk or Manjaro and Ozempic. Um, these have really been unbelievable performers. Both stocks are up about 50% year to date. And uh, as I mentioned before, have been uh, big contributors to our performance as well. Um, MedTech is another area that we continue to like. Medtech, by MedTech, I mean medical equipment and devices typically consumed in hospital settings. Um, MedTech is playing an increasingly important role in treating and managing diseases, and we think that's a long-term trend that uh, certainly has a long runway. Um, the sector has been under pressure lately, and that's been largely driven by the risk that these disruptive GLP-1 or weight loss drugs um, could potentially reduce the long-term potential of uh, the end markets for MedTech. Um, Honestly, we think these risks are valid and we're, we're certainly watching them very closely, but in a lot of instances, they are overblown. And um, again, this is an area where active management can be beneficial, where you want to invest in the companies that aren't going to be impacted as much and avoid the ones that really do face some uh, some long term headwinds. And then finally, um, managed care is an area that we've warmed up to recently. Um, managed care typically is characterized as a more defensive area of the sector. Um, it's a bit of a safe haven. These companies generate very consistent revenue streams from the premiums of their beneficiaries. Um, we were more worried about this group in Q1 and Q2 when hospital utilization was picking up, but 
Um, as I said, we're much more comfortable with that now, and the valuations have come back, and they're actually quite attractive right now. So um, that's an area that we're um, a little bit more uh, interested in right now. So um, I talked about a bit about biopharma, but I think let's bring in Richard and ask him a few questions. Um, Richard, one of the questions I get the most is related to the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA. Um, I know that you and I have had a lot of discussions on this topic, but maybe you could share your thoughts on the impact that you expect this to have on biopharma companies' earnings, and what are you seeing companies doing in response to the new legislation? Sure. I think just to generally characterize how we feel about the IRA, I think the impact is less severe and occurs more slowly than is generally expected. Uh, the primary reason, um, so CMS, the, 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 the agency that administers Medicare, uh, is choosing drugs for negotiation, both from the retail side and from the hospital side. On the retail side, what they're doing is choosing drugs based on their gross spending before discounts. But most of the drugs on that side of the equation are heavily, heavily discounted. So what they did in the first round, they chose 10 drugs. Seven of those drugs have discounts already before negotiation that are below the target set by the statute. Um, so it is unlikely that the prices of those drugs are going to change dramatically. And then of the other three, two of those are having price declines because of a similar competition that mean that ultimately, by the time the prices are negotiated and set, those products' prices will probably not be affected by the negotiation either. So uh, the IRA this year, uh, it, it's uh, negotiating drugs whose prices will be changed in 2026. So the first uh, hit is, is out there a bit. And then each year they negotiate a few more drugs up to a max of, I believe, 30 uh, for price discounts in future years. Um, so as long as the retail selection is based on gross spending, which it is by law, uh, that will limit the effect uh, of the IRA on uh, retail sales in particular. Uh, and uh, it's just geared to uh, unfold uh, gradually. What manufacturers are doing uh, to respond are two things. One is legal challenges. So you see legal challenges at the national level from the trade association, constitutional-based challenges may or may not succeed. Uh, but then you're also seeing more narrow challenges about whether or not CMS is overstepping its authority in applying some of the negotiating tactics that they called for in their guidance. Um, so it's the, the, the price impacts are not going to get worse than we expected, uh, and they may be a little bit um, uh, a, a somewhat attenuated uh, if uh, any of these legal challenges um, prove fruitful. Great. And do you think it's fair to say that a lot of these these um, you know factors are kind of priced into the stocks? Like it, it does feel like. I mean, I know when the the initial list was released at the end of August, the the pharma stocks really didn't react much. They didn't go up or down. It, it felt like a bit of a nothing event. Um, do you get that sense that that maybe this is kind of priced in and and it's it's not as much of an overhang as we may 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 perceive it to be? Yeah, hundred percent. It's the devil you know, right? So if we look at um, how investors felt about drug stocks before the act uh, was passed, uh, there was a great deal of uncertainty as to what would eventually pass Congress, right? It's it's very hard to predict. So there is a bit of a risk discount. But once the act did pass, it's it's very complex and it took people a little bit of time to get their heads around it. Uh, now that we've done that, now that we've seen the first tranche of drugs selected, um, it's just now part of the background noise of uh, investing in the industry. But it's, um, again, uh, fairly easy to quantify, fairly easy to understand, and it's relatively glacial in its movements. Uh, so it's it's by no means the dominant uh, variable in investing above pharma uh, at this point. Great. And Richard, the other question I get a lot about in biopharma is related to M and A. Um, we have an image showing that M and A capacity in the sector, uh, you know, it's it's quite high, and there's a lot of dry powder right now. Um, how important has M and A been historically to performance in this sector, and do you think the current setup lends itself to to more deals? Yeah, I think with the exception of the current rate environment, right? So I think you're you're absolutely correct that there's dry powder, there's plenty of capital uh, around to be uh, redeployed. Um, the only issue is your ability to do debt financing for deals is, is you know, it's not obviously it's not as great today as it was uh, six months ago. Um, in terms of the impact of M&A on performance, not, not being pejorative or silly about it, but it really tends to affect the target more than the acquirer. Um, the acquirers in the space have had um, um, 
uh, limited success, uh, I would say, uh, in 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 acquisitions. So, um, you know, if we see a Pfizer or a Lilly or or, or a Merck uh, out there making a big acquisition, uh, it's not always the greatest thing for Merck. It tends to be greater, uh, obviously, a bigger benefit uh, for the companies that are acquired. So, I think from an investment perspective, uh, typically the way we like to play uh, M&A opportunity is to look for uh, companies that are likely to be acquired. And these tend to be smaller to mid-cap companies that are what we call net innovators, right? So they have more product, new product flow and more innovation coming than they have patents expiring, uh, or they have, you know, one or two assets that are just coming through the clinic uh, and getting ready to go into the approval process. Uh, those companies uh, tend to be uh, the ones that get picked up in acquisition. Great. Um Maybe let's talk a bit about the most uh, popular topic in biopharma today, and that would be the weight loss drug boom that we're seeing. Um, we've seen some pretty ambitious estimates from the sell side saying this could be a $100 billion opportunity, uh, and it's even starting to have an impact on companies outside of healthcare in the food and beverage industry, for example. Um, Richard, is this GLP-1 hype real, and what is the potential upside for these you know, miracle weight loss drugs. Yeah, so the uh, the GLP ones are the real are, are a real deal, uh, and the commercial uh, potential is significant. We, I mean, we certainly it, it, we certainly don't see a hundred billion dollars. Or if we just uh, count noses and look at uh, you know very high compliance rates, we put put really the best possible assumptions uh, on the U.S. market. We get to a number somewhere in the thirty billion dollars per year. That's a huge number. Uh, Humira is the largest drug in American history. It peaked at about 18 billion. Um, our expected value for the GLP ones in a beast, in in um, uh, you know not just diabetes, but in uh, treatment of uh, obese patients and reduction of cardiovascular risk. That incremental demand, I think we said, was potentially um, uh, 18 uh, to 20 billion dollars a year, so it could you know be as large as just just the weight loss part of the equation could be as large as Humira, you know, never mind the type two side of the equation. So, you know, the change in valuations, you, you, you know, they make sense, right? Um, the you know what these drugs have shown is is you know not not only do they reduce weight, which they do, um, but um, uh, Wagobi uh, from Novo has shown that the reduction in weight also brings a reduction in major cardiovascular events, um, and that really, you know, kind of moves it a little bit out of the category of weight loss drug and gives prescribers much more motive to um, uh, to get this drug to patients. Right. And Richard, uh, maybe for the benefit of uh, folks who don't know it as well, but can you maybe just walk us through from a high level how these drugs work? And what are the short-term and long-term side effects that you're you're watching for? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the GLP ones are uh, they they belong to a class called incretin mimetics. Uh, incretin is a hormone that does two things that matter here. One is it delays gastric emptying. So when you eat a meal, uh, that meal is going to stay in your stomach longer before it moves into your small intestine, um, and that's going to make you feel full quicker, and it's going to make you feel full longer. So, um, you know, to overstate it, you, you know, a uh, hamburger maybe feels like Thanksgiving dinner, you know, while you're eating it, and then for a few hours after, and you just don't feel like eating more. And so that is the primary weight loss effect. The other thing that cretins do, uh, which is what really works for diabetes, which I think makes them the best drug in the class for diabetes, is they control insulin release in response to eating. So when you take insulin as an injection, uh, it's a hammer, right? So you ate something, you take some insulin, the insulin lasts longer than the meal or shorter than the meal, or it's too much for the meal or not enough for the meal. You, you know, your body's not titrating that. You're guessing how much you need with that injection. With the incretin mimetics, um, they actually help your body release insulin in response to the food that you've eaten. So it kind of synchronizes and calibrates uh, your insulin levels to your food intake, which is exactly what you want. Uh, so they're great for type 2 diabetes uh, and also highly effective for weight loss. Right. The uh, side effects, uh, the short-term side effects is, is you feel too full, right? So that's actually the, the drug effect that you're looking for for weight loss, but it's also something that patients complain about. So before these were used for weight loss per se, one of the major reasons uh, patients would quit is they would just feel full all the time. 
Um, and you can get beyond that by starting with lower doses and kind of uh, working your way up. Uh, and that's something that practitioners have learned to do. So that doesn't tend to be a major problem. Um, the longer term risk, there are really two. Um, one is theoretical, and that would be medullary thyroid cancer or more broadly, uh, thyroid uh, cell tumors. Um, that's a theoretical risk. Uh, it has shown up on liraglutide, uh, but not in a statistically significant way. And that's a different drug in the same class than the ones we're talking about here. Um, and it's also shown up in animal models. Um, but we've been prescribing these drugs for 18 years, and we haven't seen uh, a wave of thyroid effects. So I think most practitioners kind of put that in the back of their mind. Uh, the other risk is pancreatitis, which does occur, uh, but it occurs uh, quite infrequently. And you coach patients on the signs of pancreatitis so that they do have any signs or symptoms, they call you right away and you can stop the drug and get on top of what's happening. Um, but what I would emphasize is, hey, these things have been around for 18 years. We've used them a lot. Uh, there are unlikely to be any surprises here. Yeah, and Richard, you bring up a really interesting point. I think that um, many of us are just being introduced to the concept of GLP-1 agonists for the first time, you know, over the last year or two. But you mentioned they've been on the market for 18 years. Um, how does today's version of the drugs compare to those that were first introduced back in, uh, you know, the early to mid 2000s? Yeah, absolutely. So three advantages. One is they're dosed once a day, uh, as opposed to, you know, two or three times a day. And there's also an oral form of um, Ozempicogovi uh, called uh, Rebelsis. Um, two is going to be efficacy. Um, these are more effective. Uh, Wagovi and Ozempic are actually the same thing. Wagovi is just a higher dose, uh, but Ozempic uh, is certainly, uh, uh, and Majora, uh, are more effective in the generation of GLP-1s uh, that came before. And then finally, uh, we've got evidence with um, Wagovi specifically that fairly aggressive use of these drugs for weight loss brings uh, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular mortality benefits uh, to patients who uh, are above a certain weight, even if they don't have type 2 diabetes. So that um, potential was probably already there, always there in the class, but it's just recently been proven uh, by Novo and Wagovi. Right. And then, you know, final question on this on this topic, um, something that I'm certainly thinking about a lot, and I think a lot of healthcare investors as well, uh, and, and your expertise in pricing certainly helps, but, you know, what are payers, insurance companies, the government, what's their willingness to cover these drugs? Um, what are the reimbursement conditions like today? And what's your outlook on coverage for, for these drugs, this class of drugs? Because they are fairly expensive. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, just to give you some sense, the, the net cost per year of therapy for Wagovi right now is somewhere around $9,000. And for Ozempic, it's about $3,000. They're the same molecule. Wagovi is just a little bit higher dose. So there's always some risk of substitution in the market where payers would say, okay, hey, look, you have to start Ozempic. It's two mix per day. And if that doesn't get you to enough weight loss, we'll put you on Wagovi, which is 2.4 mix per day, but at a much higher cost. Um, so I, I think what payers are likely to do, and I think what Novo and Lilly are, are likely to realize, is that w when you say weight loss drug to a payer, that 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 potentially causes a panic, and you never want the payer to panic. Because the first thing they do is just go behind a brick wall, and then they just don't want patients to have access to it. Um, the sensible approach is to come in and say, look, we're going to target this body mass index or this weight uh, height ratio, and above, not below. Uh, here's the marketing campaign, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you're just kind of titrating that drug into the population so that you're not blowing up the plan's budget this year. Um, so we we saw this um, this phenomenon uh, twice recently, the PCSK9s, Repath or Praluent, uh, injectable drugs for um, uh, cholesterol, uh, really effective, but really expensive. Um, and uh, uh, th those companies came at the payers pretty aggressively, you know, aggressive plan for rolling them out and having lots of patients use it. Payers just built a brick wall, didn't let them in. And clinical practice just got frustrated that you can't get a PCSK9 approved, even though we'd love to have it. So nobody writes for the class anymore. And I think Novo and Lilly have learned that, um, learned that hard lesson. And they're not going to charge the gates, if you will. Uh, but they're going to, you know, be sensible and open and transparent about their marketing plans and have these roll out in a gradual way so that payers can be ahead of the curve 
in their budgets, right? So they want to set their premiums for 24 uh, uh, based on the realization that these drugs are going to be a part of the population. And they're going to want Novo and Lilly to kind of play within that uh, budget. Uh, and then the budget the next year gets larger and larger. And that's really the way to build these franchises with, is with some patience uh, over uh, uh, patients, uh, i.e. NCE, uh, uh, over time. Uh, and I think if they take that approach, they can be quite successful. Okay, great. Um, maybe let's move on to ground zero for the impacts of what these drugs uh, could mean, and that would be in the the med tech sector. So, this was a really uh, this this area was performing very well in H one. Um, that was largely predicated on the headwinds from the the COVID era kind of becoming tailwinds. You had supply chain pressures easing. Uh, labor shortages in the hospitals, which were a ma major issue in 2022, were starting to improve. And we saw these um, surgery backlogs starting to emerge. Basically, people that hadn't got gone and gotten elective surgeries for a few years were now starting to come back to the hospital. So, um, you know, the operating environment was was great for medtech and it, and it still remains so. Um, but then Novo Nordisk poured a bit of cold water on the whole um, the whole trend in August with their uh, select study, which showed, as you mentioned, um, the impacts on cardio cardiovascular outcomes. Um, yep. You know, now that this GL these, this GLP one hype has has creeped into the market, and it's starting to make us question the long term opportunities for med tech companies. Um, you know, are these drugs able to cure all diseases, and are the the concerns for med tech companies warranted? Um, you know, what what impacts do you think they're going to have on med tech companies and, you know, are some yeah. more impacted than others? Yeah, absolutely. Let's take this in layers. So certainly obesity uh, and uh, other comorbidities go hand in hand, right? We know that. We know that as people are uh, heavier, uh, especially across certain thresholds, that other problems begin to emerge. Um, but to take the entire med tech sector out and discard it is is silly. Um, so let's just take it in layers. Let's look at orthopedics first. Um, so one of the most profitable things about orthopedics would be a joint replacement. There are BMI thresholds for joint replacement. If your patient is above that BMI threshold, they don't get the joint replacement. Um, if you get them below that BMI threshold, they can get the joint replacement. So Wagovi is actually a tool for orthopedic surgeons. Uh, it's not a problem for them. So you know, the, the sort of broader epidemiologic argument of, hey, if these patients are lighter, they'll put less wear and tear in their joints. Um, you know, I'm BMI 25 and I had an MRI last night because my joints are in trouble, right? So it's it, it just doesn't make sense. If anything, I actually think these weight loss drugs are probably better for orthopedics. Interesting. Um, and as I've said to you before, my son's an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm proud of saying that he uh, has a great frustration with patients who uh, need a joint replacement and can't get one because of weight. Um, and sending them for bariatric surgery is pretty aggressive, given the morbidity and mortality there. Having Wagovi uh, to get a patient within range for uh, a joint implant uh, is a big deal. Cardiology. So um, let's talk. Let's talk about Edwards, and I'm not pitching Edwards. Let's use it as an example, right? Uh, the valves. So your heart valves are like a door that opens and uh, opens hard and slams shut 72 times a minute for your entire life. Whether you're big, small, sedentary, active, that adds up, right? So the tabbers, um, uh, those um, transaortic uh, valve replacements, those things are going to happen whether people are heavy or not. Um, Congestive heart failure, you know, tends to go along with weight. Certainly people uh, who are heavier are going to have put more of a burden on their heart. But COPD, smoking, these types of things are also a major contributor uh, to uh, congestive heart failure and the need for pumps, for example, like uh, Abiomed. Um, uh, so I, you know, I don't see a direct drive relationship between, uh, you know, population weight loss and, and those things. And then finally, um, the, the the impact of population weight loss is likely to be gradual. Um, uh, so it's not like, uh, you know, Wagovi gets used uh, this quarter and, you know, there's an air pocket of cardiovascular demand the next quarter. Uh, I just don't see it happening that way. And one last comment. So there's a bill in the U.S. Congress to uh, cover uh, weight loss drugs in Part D, uh, and that uh, elicited a response from the Congressional Budget Office who dug into the data and showed that even when patients lose weight, uh, Medicare patients lose weight, our spending on them doesn't change. Uh, so um, 
uh, you know, someone who has managed their weight well their entire life is going to have a certain rate of morbidity and mortality. Someone who has been very heavy for a very long period of time who loses that weight, that's certainly a good thing, but it doesn't really reclassify their level of healthcare expense back to that of someone who was a normal weight for their entire life. Uh, so it's a long winded way of saying, I think the cardiology sell off is overdone. Some of the, um, uh, the, 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 the one place where it makes sense is bariatric surgery, right? So um, you, you're getting really meaningful weight loss uh, with Wagovi um, uh, and Mujaro, uh, and it is a viable and preferable alternative to bariatric surgery uh, for a lot of patients. My personal feeling is that it would it makes no sense uh, to perform bariatric surgery on a patient unless they have failed the GLP-1 first. Uh, right. So I do think that you will see that demand for that slow slow down a bit. Um, the last battleground area has been diabetes, uh, specifically mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes. Um, I think that one's, there's certainly bulls and bears on each side of that debate. Where do you stand on the impact that these drugs could have on the type 2 diabetes population and the progression into that condition? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing. So I, ever for 18 years, ever since this class came out, I've been in favor of starting type 2 diabetics on GLP-1s, but they've always been put back here, great glass in case of emergency only. You've got to fail metformin. You've got to fail all these other things. So I've always thought was, was silly because I, I think this is the best class. So I think what happens is, is you know, the GLP-1s are going to move earlier in the treatment regimen for patients with type 2 uh, diabetes. Um, and so that's going to be one effect on the GLP-1s, which adds demand to the GLP-1s uh, above and beyond uh, the weight loss effect. Um, for patients that are not yet type 2 diabetics but might become type 2 diabetics with further weight loss, that's where the weight loss demand for GLP-1s is going to have an effect, right? So you're just about uh, to an insulin intolerance level where you're going to be classified as a type 2 diabetic, but you take these drugs, you lose weight, and you don't become a type 2 diabetic. Well, you still become a GLP-1 patient, right? Um, uh, right. Instead of being um, uh, starting on the traditional um, uh, products, which are either generic or super cheap, right? So metformin, generic. Uh, or uh, the SGLT2s, the DPP4s, uh, which right now are selling at 80 plus percent discount rates in the market. Uh, insulins, 80 plus percent discount rates. Um, so, and then on, on the tech side, uh, you know, smart pumps, things like that um, uh, for insulin, will there be some demand effect there? Yeah, I think you'd have to squint hard to find it. Honestly, I, I don't think that we're, we're going to get an air pocket of demand for, um, uh, for, for, for insulin pumps because of uh, GLP ones. There, there'll be a, some effect, whether it's measurable or not, I don't know, but it's not going to be profound. Yeah. And, and to your point, even if there are effects, your point earlier, um, you know, these impacts will be gradual in nature and we're likely not going to see the impacts on demand for CGMs, for example, for 10 years until you know, you really do start seeing population level weight loss. That's exactly right. And and the other thing to think about is, and, you know, I, I think when we're doing this forecast, people tend to just intuitively think about, okay, patients that become type two are really overweight. And if you can stop them from being really overweight, they don't become type two. That's only part of the population. There, there are plenty of people, uh, you know, BMI 25, 26, 27, that develop type two diabetes and insulin intolerance uh, over time and changing their BMI is not going to do anything about that. Right. Um, so it's yeah I do I do I th I think the the med tech sell off was um, ridiculously overdone honestly yeah well it's encouraging because we're we're still invested in those companies and in fact have been adding to some of our cardiology names for example in the last few weeks just based on the sell off and I think there's a, a pretty good tactical opportunity here in a lot of these names that are a bit oversold um, before we move on from GLPs. Um, you know, can you, I ju I'm just curious, can you think of any other scenarios in your career where there was this much hype around a new therapy? And, um, you know, how did it play out compared to those initial expectations or or what, what was perceived to be a, a risk? Yeah, so there, um, yeah, there, there are good comparisons and bad comparisons in terms of the nature of the outcome. So the obvious comparison would be FinFin from American Home Products, a diet drug. 
uh, pretty effective, tons of side effects, uh, ultimately was pulled off the market. Uh, but that was a relatively um, new, I mean, the two components were not new, but the use, using them together was new. That was a new therapy, right? And, and you always open the door to surprises when you first start putting something into the population. That doesn't really apply here because we've been using this class again for 18 years. Um, so here, I think the, um, you know, a good example would be the anti-TNS, the Humira class. When that first came out, uh, that was a game changer because patients with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you're trying to slow joint um, uh, damage. Um, you're only able to slow it so much. You're really not able to uh, stop it. Um, and the side effects are terrible, right? We're getting methotrexate, um, on, uh, you know, drugs that we use for cancer, things like that for rheumatoid arthritis. So anti-TNS were, were a big deal, expected to become a big deal, and indeed did become a very big deal. And in fact, the largest class, uh, the largest single product in, in history and the largest class in the current U.S. market. The cautionary tale, again, is a PCSK9, right, where repathoproluent, uh, very effective at reducing cardiovascular risk, like the GLP-1s are now shown to be, but they just charged the gate, right? They really um, left the payer with no option other than just to build a brick wall, stop the whole process, try to slow it down. And, and you know, anyone listening who's ever been involved with a product launch, it's crucial, right? Once it, when that thing, when that product is taking off, if it fails, it is awfully hard to resurrect it, right? The brand kind of gets a black eye. That did happen with the PCS K9s, and and they've been uh, disappointing. So the um, I I do believe that these brands are in control of their own fate, right? I, th I think they have a very manageable pathway, uh, as long as the brand managers are sober, transparent. Um, and steady in the way they approach the pair. Yeah. Okay, great. That's that's uh, super insightful. Um, let's maybe just spend a bit of time on managed care. Uh, we've aptly named this near-term protection on this slide. Um, but, you know, managed care companies, like I mentioned earlier, are historically been quite defensive. Um, these companies are are inherently linked to higher healthcare spending broadly because the demand for healthcare, um, you know, it re remains stable regardless of economic conditions. And this sector I also like to um, think is highly correlated to the long-term demographic tailwinds that we have. Um, and, you know, one area in particular that we like within managed care is Medicare Advantage companies. Um, Richard, can you maybe just walk us through what Medicare Advantage plans are and what does the growth outlook look like for that uh, specific area of the insurance market. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's let's back up to before Medicare Advantage existed. The only form of Medicare that you would get as a senior uh, or someone with a disability that qualifies you for Medicare would be what we call fee for service, where you go see a physician, um, you pay the money, uh, you get the receipt, you send the receipt in, CMS sends you the money back, right? It's just uh, or most of the money back. And you choose your physician, you choose the procedure, you choose your surgeon, there's really no restriction. Medicare Advantage is managed care in Medicare, right? So it's a Medicare beneficiary that agrees to enroll in a plan and let the plan make network decisions. So you can or can't go to this pharmacy or this doctor, or can or can't have that drug, um, but the premiums are lower. And with some of that savings, uh, the Medicare Advantage plans also will give you benefits like health club memberships and, and things like that. Um, Medicare Advantage is taking over Medicare. Um, so you're definitely in the right uh, corner of the swimming pool here uh, for managed care in terms of just inherent demographic growth, right? As you said, um, uh, you know, folks my age and older are, uh, you know, sort of the growth uh, in the population, number one. And then number two, especially uh, the younger of us as we age into Medicare are choosing Medicare Advantage. Um, and so it's becoming an increasingly more prevalent part of Medicare. The challenge, is, as you and I have talked about a lot, is the way Medicare Advantage is priced in a local area is based off the prevailing fee-for-service price in that same area. But now that Medicare Advantage is, is the dominant part of the sample and the fee-for-service part is smaller, the validity of that reference point, the fee-for-service average, is declining. Uh, something will have to be done about that. Um, right now that does result in what uh, some people would argue is an overpayment to Medicare Advantage. Um, and it's a plausible argument, but um, 
Congress does not want to take the Medicare Advantage option away from enrollees because they're seniors, they dominate the vote, and most of them are in a Medicare Advantage plan. So you don't want to disrupt that. Um, so I, I do think that there will be some changes in the payment rates and payment levels for Medicare Advantage plans. Um, Congress has done this before and gotten it wrong uh, and learned that lesson, right? So they um, uh, got the payment rates wrong, Medicare then managed care uh, plans left the market. Um, beneficiaries were furious, rightly. Uh, they don't want to re recreate that uh, problem again. So your growth, your your growth drivers, of course, are the, the change of the demographics, the preference of uh, new newly minted seniors for Medicare Advantage. Uh, the headwind is probably some moderation of the payment rate, um, but we take a lot of comfort in realizing that Congress knows they can't get that wrong. Um, because of the political consequences of um, uh, damaging Medicare Advantage or, or, or inaccurately pricing it. Right. And do you think the current conditions in Congress right now, um, obviously there's been a lot of infighting within the Republican Party. Um, you have a split House or a, a split Congress rather. Um, you know, how how easy is it for them to get anything done on Medicare, even if they want to and if there is a willingness to bipartisan support, like how yeah. how much can they get done here? It's super hard. So the only way to get it done is bipartisan, um, both mathematically, um, uh, given given the closely divided nature of both chambers, uh, and politically. You, Med Medicare and Social Security are um, something you pick up and beat your opponent with in every election cycle, right? So if your opponent says, hey, we want to do this to Medicare, even if you say you want the gold plate benefits, your opponent will find a way to say that you're trying to cut Medicare, and they'll just wear you out with it. Um, so the, 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 the changes that happen to this program are intelligent, you know, senior members of either party, you know, back in a closed room, figuring out what needs to happen. And then trying to go out and sell that to their relative caucuses. That's just impossible right now. Um, so you either need a more bipartisan environment, uh, um, uh, or you need one uh, party to have uh, a dominant uh, share. Um, you know, sort of the bicameral majorities that Obama had when uh, he came into office, mm -hmm. uh, or you need a crisis. Um, and so I, I do expect that this Medicare Advantage quote overpayment issue is going to run a while um, before Congress really has anything to do, before they're really able to do anything about it. Sure. Um, you know, one one thing that we've talked about a lot recently is potentially a bigger risk, and that would be for the pharmacy benefit managers or uh, PBMs. Can maybe just talk about, um, you know, potential for legislation in that area, and and maybe it would be helpful yeah. just a bit of a background on what PBMs do and, um, you know, how they're embedded within these managed care companies. Yeah, so uh, PBM is a pharmacy benefit manager, and what they do is uh, manage pharmacy benefit. And the way they do that is they um, uh, create a formulary or a list of products that are covered. Uh, and of course, by exclusion, a list of products that are not covered. And that exclusion, uh, the threat of being excluded, gives them negotiating leverage with manufacturers where they negotiate lower prices. <clears throat> and then they pass on part of that lower price uh, to the plan sponsor, right? General Motors, John Deere, Ford, whoever the plan sponsor is, or you know, Medicaid or uh, a Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, and then they keep part of that transaction. Where they've gotten themselves in trouble is there's a real information asymmetry there. Um, you know, even the plan sponsors, uh, certainly the patients, uh, don't really know uh, how big the rebate was and what the true net price is and how much of that benefit I got versus how much the PBM kept. So the PBMs have benefited from that information asymmetry and they've been able to hold on to a, high, a larger share of the total rent, if you will, or total potential profit. Um, that's the bad thing about PBMs. The good thing about PBMs from the perspective of Congress is they really have affected drug prices. Um, net drug prices have been falling in the United States since the first quarter of 2008. Um, and that is because of actions taken by PBM. So Congress knows that PBMs are taking too much out of the transaction and they want to reduce that margin and take away some of that information asymmetry by introducing transparency, but they don't want to so weaken them that they are no longer an effective counterweight to drug pricing. Um, where this stands is actually in DC last Thursday in a working group on, on just this issue. Uh, there were, I think, three bills in the House that have now been consolidated into one bill. 
Um, and there are still multiple bills in the Senate. These have not yet been consolidated. If we estimate where the Senate bill is going to go, it's going to look real different than the House bill. Uh, so what that means is one chamber would have to agree to take the approach that the other chamber uh, is taking. Um, my channel checks uh, as recently as last Thursday suggest that that's just not going anywhere. Uh, certainly, I'll never say certainly, but uh, almost certainly not this year. Um, and it doesn't, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but it doesn't look like it's uh, super likely to happen next year either. It is ultimately going to happen. The PBMs are firmly in the crosshairs and there is some regulation and or legislation coming their way. Um, but it just looks like it's in the pretty early stages of being uh, of being cooked up. Great. OK, well, I think, um, you know, maybe we'll we'll leave it there. Um, I'll maybe just leave everyone with a few parting thoughts on on, you know, why we think right now is a great time to be adding to healthcare. care. Um, you know, the sector is it has lagged this year significantly. Um, but we are seeing the macro outlook becoming a bit more cloudy right now. So we think that right now it is a good time to be maybe positioning yourself a little bit more defensively. Um, the products and services that are sold in healthcare, they do represent a fundamental part of people's lives and the spending within the sector is needs based. And these companies do continue to generate revenue and profits regardless of economic conditions. Um, I made the point earlier that Canadian investors are are generally very underweight this sector. We don't really have much of a healthcare sector here in Canada. So, um, you know, it's 13% of the S&P 500 and it begs the question what your overall expect uh, exposure is to, to healthcare. Um, these companies do also have a long history of growing their dividends. That's particularly beneficial in a rising rate environment. That's what we're seeing today. And finally, you get diversification within healthcare. So strategies like ours with the help of Dr. Richard Evans, um, you know, they provide you exposure to bar biopharma, med tech, managed care, and the other great industries uh, that exist within healthcare. So this does result in a very attractive defensive growth profile and offers a, a good mix of dividend income as well as capital appreciation potential. So, um, you know, we really do think now is a good time to be sharpening your pencil and taking a, a closer look at, at healthcare. Um, so, Richard, thanks again for joining us today, um, and thank you yeah, all for, for tuning in. Uh, and we hope to speak with you soon. Thanks.